sorry about that. So, um, so we talked for one for ten for ten for ten extra minutes because of this. So, but 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 because after the bit of the coffee break anyway, it shouldn't affect the other talks. So, it's my pleasure to introduce Ken Brown from the University of Glasgow. Ken is well known is well known in the in the mathematical community. As a researcher, he's made important contributions to the field of non-commutative non algebra, in particular Hopf algebras, and he's among the leading mathematicians in that area. Ken is also the vice president of the London, uh, London Mathematical Society, an organization which has been extremely supportive of the YRM, among others in the hands. And this support has been in place through the through the whole period the Warren has been running and and has continued in place here. Ken has been instrumental in making that happen. Um, related to the subject of the conference, Ken 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 is also very active as a supervisor. He's, he's, he has supervised or is supervising numerous numerous PhD students. There's me, of course, or, or those of you from Edinburgh, you know, I've known me and All in all, we're, we're very happy to have him here and we're grateful he could, he could make the time to, 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 to come to talk to, to, to us here. And I look forward to hearing him speak to, to, speak to us about non-commutative neopotent groups. Thanks very much. It's uh, hard to follow that, especially after all the delay of the introduction. Right. Um, yeah, before I, I really start, I should, uh, I, since, especially since I won't be here tomorrow, uh, I want to thank the organizers. It's a really great conference this time. Uh, it's, it's, uh, um, a really good thing that the YRM exists, and I hope it continues in, in those from strength to strength. So all the organizing committee, all the people that helped them, and Helen from uh, ICMS, I think they've, they've done a great job. So, much service. Uh, right, my title is uh, No Commutative Unipotent Groups. It will be um, incredibly elementary, uh, so uh, you know, various apologies. And one of them is uh, some of you will be insulted by how elementary it is. I'm going to spend most of my time uh, defining the, uh, the three words there in the title, starting with group. Uh, well, that's not quite, but you know, almost. <laughs> and uh, so you'll probably feel insulted. Everybody in the room probably feel insulted some of the time, but you know, never mind. And to kind of leaven the, um, the story, I'll try and interject some kind of meta metamathematical uh, comments from, from place to place. So at some point behind this, this is joint work with uh, a former student of mine, uh, Stephen O'Hagan, uh, a collaborator, James Ryan, from uh, Seattle, and one of James's students, uh, Zhuang. But uh, the only person on that list, including myself, who really will have a result uh, on the board today is, is Guan Bin, uh, who uh, is finishing his PhD this year. And so this is maybe the best news you hear all day. Guan Bin has a job in, uh, <laughs> in um, University of California, Los Angeles, starting in September. So it is possible to, uh, to get a PhD and then get an academic job. <laughs> and right, so groups. So it, um, first of all, algebraic groups, because that's the setting we're in, and in particular we're in uh, characteristic zero. So everywhere throughout um, K will be an algebraic closed field of characteristic zero. And um, 
everything goes wrong, more or less, that I say if you drop those hypotheses, those hypotheses on the on the field. So an affine algebraic group over k is a group which is uh, an affine variety. And the multiplication of the inverse formation are, are morphisms in the variety. Multiplication and inverses. Continuous marks, if you like. And the points, just to make sure everybody is on the board, uh, an affine variety just means the set of. Uh, zeros of some uh, polynomial functions on K M affine M space uh, uh, sum M. Okay, so for instance, uh, SL2K, so 2 by 2 matrices of determinant 1 over K, as you know, and then the, uh, the define, there's only a single defining uh, polynomial equation you need there to get you from affine 4 space to SL2K, and that's X1, X2, 2, minus X1, 2, X2, 1. Minus one equals zero. So where x, i, j, etc. are the, you know, the x one one is the map that takes you from a matrix to its one one entry. And so, and then of course you can do S L N for for any n. Uh, right. Um, so one studies uh, an algebraic group. G or, or any uh, affine variety for that matter over K um, by its um, coordinate ring, <coughs> which I'm going to write as OG. So that just means the by definition, this is the set of polynomial functions. It's a ring. Uh, how is it a ring? Because uh, if we take F and H, say, in O of G, then F, H evaluated on X, X, and G, and is by definition Fx times Hx. So as you can see, it's not only a ring, it's a commutative ring, which will be kind of relevant later. One advantage of this technology is that you have to stop some of the time, or at least it kind of obliges you to stop. So maybe that's a good thing. Um, so for instance, O of SL2 is so you've got the polynomials in the uh, four coordinate functions, but they don't all give you different maps because the determinant of any matrix in an SL2 goes to 1, and so you factor out by the ideal generated by this defining function. That's the, the ring. 
and the name of the game, or a, a name of the game in doing uh, the theory of algebraic groups is to study groups by means of their quantum things. So if, you, if you're going to do that, of course, it looks on the face of it, face of it as if you've, uh, you've lost a lot of information, and you better not have. When you lost a lot of information when you go from the group to the, the ring. <clears throat> but in fact, the ring, the coordinate ring, remembers the group structure. So let me uh, recall for you how that happens. Um, so on 14. So, first of all, how do you remember multiplication? Well, um, that's uh, using a co product. Which is a map. To OG tensor with itself. And the way it works is this if we have uh, F one of our coordinate functions, we, we want to define a map uh, using F. Um, the direct product of g with itself to k. And the way this works is if you take x and y, two elements in your group, then you evaluate f on the, the group product. And you can see then that this gadget is a way of encoding the, the group structure within this, this delta. And then the similar things to uh, remember the unit of the group that gives you the whole unit. That's a map. Sorry, mine is bad. <laughs> From O G to K, which just evaluates at the identity. And the other thing we need to remember is the inverse of a group element. And that is done using the anti group, which is a map S from O G. So an SF evaluation of X is by definition F of X index. So all this stuff, 4G, Delta, Epsilon, and S. So it obviously satisfies some axioms, which are kind of messy to write down. For instance, there's an axiom called co-associativity that this thing satisfies because the group multiplication is associative and uh, a number of other axioms, which are a pain to, to write. But all that structure together gives you a, a, a hot algebra. Algebra over k and it's and it's commutative because the ring is commutative. So it turns out this is a brilliant gadget because we in fact get an equivalence. On the one hand, uh, affine algebraic groups. Okay. And on the other hand, affine commutative. Affine here just means um, finitely generated as an algebra. 
and the affine here means that it matches up with something which is finally generated as an algebra, basically. <laughs> so, <clears throat> yeah, first kind of digression, I suppose, and, and I feel very embarrassed about this because there's at least one uh, internationally renowned category theorist in the audience, and I know that there's a kind of a, um, theme uh, of category theory somehow running through, and here I am. Uh, bringing Coast to Newcastle, telling you why categories are useful. It's kind of uh, bizarre uh, for me to be doing that. But still, what there is a kind of, uh, we, we take equivalencies of categories for granted somehow. And uh, the uninitiated might say, well, big deal. We haven't done anything here because you've just got you know, one way of describing a bunch of things. And then over here, there's another way. But a lot of mathematics is about language and context and intuition as well, you know, the human bit. I mean, after all, every single statement I make about an algebraic group here, I can, because of this fact, translate it across in principle to a statement here, either true or false, uh, and vice versa. But nevertheless, some things are very natural to think about over here that you would never, I suspect, think of even addressing on the other side. And, and so it's a very powerful thing, uh, this uh, idea of an equivalence of categories. I, I suppose this one is, is kind of the granddaddy of them all in some sense because it goes back to, to Descartes, really. I mean, that's really what's in the back of this. Descartes was the first person to really do an equivalence of categories, I guess, and, and make use of it. But this is kind of a 20th, 20th century refinement of that. Yeah, so that's the first word in the title. Uh, what about the, uh, the second The second word going back, backwards? Uh, unipotent. Uh, so what's a unipotent group? Uh, so the, the, the first definition is the uh, um, algebraic group. U is unipotent. Whenever it acts on a rational representation, and every element. So if you haven't seen that before, it maybe doesn't mean that much to you. But it doesn't really matter because I'm going to show you. We we'll think of, we we'll think by examples, yeah. and uh, I'll show you uh, examples. So the, the kind of basic example is uh, what I'm going to call T N K. So N is well, to be non-trivial, it should be at least two integer. And it's just the uh, upper triangular matrices of size n with ones on the diagonal, zeros below, and anything of k up above. So star just means arbitrary elements of, of, of k. And you can see, if you just think about the, the natural a representation of this on n space by matrix multiplication and column vectors that every element is, at, is uh, satisfying this uh, condition here in the, the definition. Um, so that's an example. Um, the first non trivial case is the two, isn't it? So look at that one. It's all the matrices. And if you just mentally multiply a couple of those matrices together, you realize that the way this works is you add in that entry. So this is isomorphic as a group to the additive group of the field. 
So, so included in these TNs is the attitude group of the field. The, is a, the kind of basic building block of uh, of um, unipotent uh, groups is the attitude group of the field in a very precise way. I'll uh, maybe to explain that. We should have said, I should say, just since that example is so easy, we can um, think about what it's coordinate range. <coughs> so it's, it's basically the, the field itself affine one space, and so as a, a variety, we know what it is, as, a, as, a, as it's affine one space, it's coordinate ring is just polynomials in one variable where x <coughs> of the number is just a number. But what about delta? <coughs> so because delta is a, I, I should have said this, I didn't. Um, back in the definition on the top board on the right there, all these maps uh, are algebra homomorphisms of delta. So because Delta is an algebra hall. I only need to tell you what it does to x. And if you do look at the definition and just do a little bit of matrix multiplication, you see that that's what you get. So very simple, familiar even, uh, sort of formula. Okay, the, the basic theorem about unipotent groups is this one. is an affine group over K and uh, H is coordinate ring. Then following our equivalent, first of all G unipotent. Second, G has to be a closed subgroup of one of these TNs. Closed just means that it's a, a, a subvariety uh, of the variety TN. That's a dangerous thing. Torsion free means the only element of finite order is the identity. And no potent means the center is not one. The center of the group is not one. If you factor it by the center, uh, then the center of the factor group is not one, and so on. And after finitely many steps, you get to the whole group that way. And if you look at Tn, you can see you can do that by starting at the top right corner, these guys are central, and then kind of going in towards the, the main diagonal. And each time you're picking off some copies of the additive group of the field, actually, when you take the next level of center. So that tells you somehow the, uh, the structure of the group, in some sense, but also the structure of its coordinate rate. And you, you realize, of course, this is affine space here, arbitrary entries in the stars and no nothing else to say as a, as a, as a space it's a, it's a vector space of a certain size um, so we know that its coordinate ring is going to be polynomials um, but the nice thing the beautiful thing is that the converse is true uh, so number 4 H equals K
So the only The only non-trivial part of this theorem, and in fact it's, it's, um, it is quite, a, quite a, a deep part, is uh, for implying the rest. The fact that, and when you think about it, it's a very, very fundamental thing, because what is it saying? It's saying, what are, you ask the question, what are the ways that you can impose a, uh, an algebraic group structure on affine m snakes? And the answer is the only ways are. Oh, goodness me. <laughs> I should just not move, right? <laughs> the only ways are to make a unipotent group on the scale. And this theorem is due to. The four implies the rest is due to Lazar in 1955. So I've time for another uh, aside here. This may be about uh, a year, 18 months ago, I was thinking about these things. And I suspected that, um, that 4 implies 1 was true. But I couldn't find it anywhere in, in the obvious books. And, uh, and I asked various friends who are experts in algebraic groups. And they said, oh, yeah, it must be true. Um, but they, uh, they couldn't tell me where the result was, and then they tried to prove it, and they couldn't prove it. <laughs> and it took, you know, it was a couple of months of asking a lot of people by chain of emails before somebody uh, said it was due to Lazar in 1955. So the moral is things disappear. You know, it's, it, it, uh, we think that everything is easy these days with Google and, uh, and um, blogs and so on. It's, not, it's still the case that results can uh, sort of almost vanish. So just because your supervisor or somebody else says, ah, that this is not known, don't trust them. Because, uh, <laughs> it's, uh, it uh, happens all the time that things are rediscovered. I was reading the other day, for instance, that the fast Fourier transform was, um, was originally proved by Gauss, apparently, in 1805, which is before Fourier, in fact, Fourier's <laughs> key publication was 1807, and, uh, but of course Gauss being Gauss, he didn't publish it. <laughs> and um, then it was rediscovered uh, several times over in the early, mid 20th century. Discovered, forgotten, discovered again. And eventually these guys, one of the names, 2K and, uh, uh, yeah, Cooley and 2K, 1965. And they get their names on the fast Fourier transform, which, and they were actually, you know, I don't know, 10th or 11th to, to discover it. But they got, uh, they got the, out into the right places and got it well known. And they have 8,000 plus citations in Google Scholar now. So, so there's another moral there. It's not enough just to prove things. You have to tell people and make sure they know. And, and uh, tell them lots of times uh, the, same, the same thing uh, as well. And uh, Lazar was a pretty, a brilliant mathematician, but pretty self-effacing uh, guy, and maybe that's part of the, part of the story. Um, yeah. Okay. So that's unipotent. What about uh, non-commutative? So where's this category thing? Yeah. So this is the second advantage of having a category equivalence is that sometimes you, you have a category you're interested in, and you say, well, it's equivalent to this other category. And then this other category lives inside uh, some bigger category. And so you can enlarge the class of objects you were originally thinking about by thinking of the enlargement happening on the other side of the equivalence. And that's a really good trick. And, uh, it's basically the trick that lies behind uh, non commutative geometry, actually. You, know, you, you have a coordinate ring of a variety or whatever, which is 
Christ, but then you say, well, why don't we just forget fugitivity? And in this case, you would then be studying after you And then you say, well, actually, this corresponds to something over here. We sort of don't know what it is, but let's pretend we do. And then uh, we study these things and say we're doing geometry. Or, you know, or it so that's the <laughs> that's that's the strategy. And it, the amazing, I mean, it, it sounds really when you <coughs> put it like that, it sounds completely dumb, doesn't it? But uh, but it works. And the thing is that somehow you get sort of beautiful and uh, important things that way. By the way, this word "afa" in here is probably wrong. You know, some of the adjectives. Uh, turn out not to be right, and you maybe have to sort of uh, correct it. Because I it might be equivalent to some other things up here, but no longer when you go to a bigger category. So you have to tune things a bit, but basically that's the, the strategy. Um, so, thinking about uh, about this theorem, theorem 1, and saying how do we sort of make it non-commutative, you might say, okay, I want to think what, uh, instead of having H here, I want to have some non-commutative version of a polynomial ring, and then say, what do I get? And there, that's simultaneously very interesting, but, but completely uh, ill-defined question because one of the fundamental issues about non-commutative affine geometry is what is a good version of a non-commutative polynomial ring? And so you're, you're, you're kind of stymied um, right at the get-go uh, if you ask it that way. So a better approach is to say what is some Hopf algebra condition that is equivalent to all these? And then say, well, we'll impose that hot algebra condition, and then we'll then we'll delete commutative and see in particular what do we get here, where, where we had uh, uh, commutative polynomials before. So that's that's the that's the strategy that I want to employ. And if we uh, do that, it turns out the right definition is. Um, of these over what what's um, connected. So a hot algebra H is connected F uh, so only simple. I'll write this down and then there's going to be some words that although you can maybe guess what they mean in the I'll define them. Uh, the only simple sub algebra of H is the field. So, um, so remember H comes equipped with this co-product, delta, which is a map from H to H tensor H. So a sub algebra is a vector subspace C uh, such that it's kind of preserved under the, the co-product. And simple is the obvious thing, that there's no sub algebras of C except for 0 and, and C. And you always have K sitting inside H, just K times 1, and the co-product being an algebra homomorphism has to send 1 to 1 tensor 1. So you see straight away this guy is uh, a sub-co-algebra. Okay? And it must be simple because it's one-dimensional as a vector space. So this condition says there's nothing else. That, that, that one sits inside every um, sub-co-algebra of H. Okay, sits inside. So that turns out to be a very useful definition. And in fact, you can add by is connected. 
to the CO1. And uh, it's, not very, it's not very hard. Um, if you, um, you know a little bit about algebraic groups, basically if you think of Julie, this is just saying the fact that there's only one simple uh, subalgebra, saying there's only one simple rational module for a, for a unipotent group, uh, namely the trivial module. It's really an equivalent statement. Uh, and, and, and conversely. Okay. So then we ask, what, going back to my strategy that I mentioned earlier, we, we can ask what are the connected Hopf algebras if we delete um, commutative, delete the fact that they're coordinate rings. Well, let's warm up. Um, instead of asking them all, let's do the next class after commutative that was of interest in the development of Hopf algebras, which is co-commutative Hopf algebras. Tau here is the flip. So the tau of A tensor B. There is B tensor B. And uh, yeah, here this one. You see that that's symmetric. And so uh, of T2K is, uh, is a co-commutative Hopf algebra. And by duality, one of these commutative Hopf algebras is co-commutative if and only if the group G is built. You know, as, as we said, as we agreed, because there's an equivalence of categories, every statement about Hopf algebra has its group theory equivalent in this world and vice versa. So we're really, if we were in the world, yeah, I've said it. So the question then is, what are the co-commutative connected Hopf algebras? We want to find a possible co-commutative analog of theorem 1. And the answer is part of a very famous theorem. It's the opposite end of the spectrum, if you like, from Lazar. Uh, I'll leave the names out for a minute so you can speculate. Anyway, I'm, I'm going to claim three names here. So I'll uh, hop K algebra H uh, which is co commutative the universal enveloping algebra of a Lie algebra. Um, so, G. Lie algebra. So the, the co-product for enveloping algebras is Really did. Well, this is the one-dimensional enveloping algebra, one-dimensional Lie algebra. So that's an example, in fact, and they all look like that. So if G has basis x1 to xn, so, um, let's stick to finite dimensional. Just the theorem is valid without finite dimensional. Let's just stick to finite dimensional for convenience. Then we have the same formula over there for these XIs. Um, 
And so you can see they're all co-commutative. So uh, these are semi um, co-commutative uh, Hopf algebras, and they're all connected. And the names here are And this is from the early 1970s, basically, this theorem. And it's actually, <coughs> I'm being slightly uh, dishonest with what I'm writing down here. This is, the theorem is more general than this. They describe basically arbitrary co commutative Hopf algebras. Over, don't, let's not forget, algebraic really closed field of characteristic zero. If you don't have that, then everything's wrong. And if you, so if you delete connected, not much more happens actually. You get a, a skewed group algebra over a, a group, obviously. <laughs> um, the, yeah, the group of the characters of the, of the, um, of the hot problem. So that, that was their, their theorem, very famous theorem from the 1970s. Um, so if you, if you look at it, um, at first glance, you think, well, actually, theorem 1, theorem 2, theorem 2, don't have that much in common. Um, but in fact, they, they do. They have a lot in common. And the way to see that there's a huge amount in common is to think about the, um, the most famous theorem about enveloping algebras or the algebras, namely the poincare burkhoff witt theorem. And this is where it made it convenient for me to stick to finite dimensional Lie algebras. Because Poincare Burkhoff Witt, remember, says that uh, UG has a vector space basis. If we stick with the same basis for G, um, we just take ordered monomials, x1 to the r1, x2 to the r2. So, intuitively, it looks like a polynomial algebra, except the multiplication doesn't commute. So you might, uh, and this, you know, highly non-mathematical statement looks like polynomials. You can make it rigorous um, by, there's a technology called um, uh, filtered algebras and associated graded algebras, and if, you, if you've done some uh, basic B theory, you'll know that that's kind of what the best way to think about the PBW theorem. So the associated graded algebra of U of G is polynomials in, in N, commutative polynomials in N variables. So there's the two theorems. Is there a common generalization? Yes, there is, unfortunately. So this um, this step to uh, working with hot algebras and to go from commutative on the one hand or co-commutative on the other to arbitrary, which is what we're going to do now. Um, really stems from the early 1980s with the discovery of quantum groups by uh, Jim Bernard <coughs> and uh, Hadiv independently uh, about 1982. And quantum groups are really nothing else but Hopf algebras that are neither commutative nor co-commutative. And a couple of things to say about that. I mean, why, why are they called quantum groups? Uh, well, because it gets you grant uh, uh, <laughs> awards. That's, that's the kind of standard joke. Uh, of course, these guys didn't need to uh, hustle for, uh, but even Brinfeld didn't need to hustle for grant awards. So they had other reasons. But, um, I mean, what it, 
basically the word quantum carries at least two meanings. It carries the non commutativity aspect from uh, quantum theory, uh, and also the idea that there's a there's a deformation, and the, the deformation gives you non commutative things, but there's a there's a classical limit which is commutative, and for many of these. Uh, uh, Hopf algebras, that is the case. And you can see that phenomenon already happening here with uh, U of G. In, with hindsight, the enveloping algebras are deformations of the polynomial rings. And once you have that way of thinking about things, it's obvious. So, I mean, it's not true to say, by the way, that, uh, that um, before 1982, Hopf algebras were either commutative or co-commutative. There were examples known, it's just that they were kind of regarded as esoteric curiosities. It's a bit like you know, that somebody said, was it um, Philip Larkin? Um, in Britain, we discovered sex in 1963. So okay, it, was, it was there before 1963, but, uh, well, <laughs> something's <laughs> happened in 1963. The Lady Chatterley Triangle was one of the things, but you were there. Yeah. <laughs> Almost moved in the room apart from me, and maybe, yeah, who remembers that? <laughs> um, yeah, but you know, there's, there's a certain city in, in the east of Scotland that I think they haven't got there yet. <laughs> 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 Just about got to trams, I believe. <laughs> Even maybe not quite there. So, what's the theorem? So, this is due to. James uh, Blaine Line, and it'll be in the Journal of the LMS uh, this year, I think. Um, so, so H uh, connected of K algebra. And over K of algebraically close characteristic zero understood uh, and the following are equivalent. And the first thing that I'm going to write down something and I'm not going to define it. L find Q of the dimension of H is finite. And this is uh, this is the right way or one right way to generalize the affine. Zero one and finite finite dimensional here uh, of zero two. Um, so approximately affine. If you say affine, it's wrong, by the way. So that's not a definition, but it's the right way to think. Um, and then H has associated. Gradient algebra H, which is not just an algebra but a Hopf algebra, um, and is uh, isomorphic as a Hopf algebra to K F bar to X. Same F. Okay, and so this means commutative polynomials here, this number two. I mean, that's part of the theorem, is you get a commutative associated gradient algebra. And as we were saying about, um, about uh, enveloping algebras, one aspect of this. Uh, sort of thing in part two is that if you come back to your original H from the curl of H, you get a statement about the vector space structure here. So H has basis um, or the binomials if you like in fight in, in, in N here it goes. It's going to the R1. Um, and once you have this theorem, 
and I'm not going to write any anything down on this, but there's a whole kind of army of technologists um, waiting to pounce and, and say uh, all sorts of things follow from that, and so on. On the kind of very trivial side, you get that it's a uh, domain as a as a ring. No no products of non-zero elements are, are zero. It's the theory. Um, very nice homologically because polynomial rings are nice and you can translate uh, etc 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 skew kalabi uh, whatever tons and tons of uh, properties so it's the start of the whole uh, um, area of, of thinking so I suppose my last kind of uh, metamathematical thing is to say um, something about something we should all think about, but maybe we don't uh, enough. What, what is a good theorem in, in mathematics? What's a good uh, uh, result to try to get? And I'm not going to I'm not going to say um, uh, here's the answer. That would be really terrible. That would be crazy because everybody should have her own answer uh, to to that question. And all I want to say is we should all think about it. If I had to make a list, I, I guess I would say um, there should be some depth. But some people think depth is the only thing. You know, if it was incredibly hard to prove, that's it. It must be great. And I think that's not right. If it's trivial, then you know it can't be very interesting. But depth is only one aspect. <clears throat> Another one is uh, kind of bringing things together from before and, and making you see them in a new light, like theorem one and theorem two. Uh, here, uh, so leading on from past context, uh, and number three would be uh, for me would be uh, opening routes to to new directions, like here. So I think uh, Guanvin's theorem does all of those things. Uh, so in my version of taste, it's uh, it's a good theorem. So I've finished, but I'm going to I'm going to stop for questions now. But then I'm going to say. I'm going to have sort of bonus one minute on the LMS. And the reason we're having the questions first is that the projector you know, takes a minute to warm up. <laughs> so I'm stopping there, and you can ask. Uh, ask Five seconds, so somebody has to ask me a question. <laughs> <laughs> or else we're going to get pretty bored. Yeah. Is this last thing you're saying about optimizing with some filtration? No, no, it's just, it's, I haven't missed anything. Uh, uh, yeah. The filtration, but you're right to ask about the filtration. The filtration that you use in your thing called the co radical filtration, which exists for any hot algebra, but. Um, is only an algebra filtration in certain circumstances, including when H is connected. It's always a co-algebra filtration, but not always an algebra filtration. But when H is connected, it is always an algebra filtration. So, uh, the primitives are the first. So, the zero one is K. The primitives are uh, well. In the case of a connected Hopf algebra, in general, it's, it's going to be the, the sum of the simple co-algebras as H two. But uh, yeah, for a connected H one is the is the primitives and so on. So I'm not confident about the lights. So can you sort of read that? Can you switch the lights on? Oh, oh thanks. Yeah, so I wanted to say, just take two minutes to say something about the London Law Society, because as Ash just said, I'm, uh, for my pains, I'm one of the two vice presidents, so I guess I kind of know something about it. Um, Elizabeth has had a stand outside all week, encouraging you to, uh, to browse and maybe to, to join. As it says there, uh, somewhere on the left-hand column, for, for PhD students, it's only 15, 14 quid a year, so it's it's very cheap. Nevertheless, you're immediately going to ask me, I'm sure, as some people already have done this week, 
why should I join? Why should I pay 14 pounds? And that's quite a tricky question, actually, to answer. Because um, if you look at the member benefits in the middle column, to be frank, they don't look all that exciting. Really. I mean, newsletter every month, well, fine, uh, et cetera. Um, but the right-hand column is the important one. Um, Astrid said that, uh, in her very nice introduction, that the LMS uh, funded, uh, partially funded the YRM. I don't know how many people know how much money. £5,800 is, is the LMS contribution. So it, it, it's non-trivial. That doesn't answer the question, why should I join? Uh, does it? But uh, the point is, charity law in this country means membership, and it's correct, as it should be this way, membership should not grant you special rights in a charity. So the, the benefits should be available to everybody. And, and so all these things down the right hand column effectively are, are available to the whole community. But it, it's kind of like your union in some sense. You, know, you, you should uh, support it and uh, um, be part of the, the community. And the more members we have at all levels, the you know, a, a PhD student, people in the middle of their careers, at the end of their careers like me maybe, and, and retired people, we should all be members because we're all part of the community. And if the YRM goes on, which I very much hope it will, and I believe it will, then the, the, the LMS should be, will, and will be involved. So you'll know, think about uh, joining up for, for that reason rather than really the, the member benefits. Okay, that's all. Thanks very much. Thank you.